Good morning, Schweitzer, and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Jim, and it's a real joy to be with you. It's going to be an awesome morning worship here at Schweitzer, and again, wherever you're at. Thanks for being here. This morning, we're looking forward to continuing our sermon series that we're calling Abraham, Faith and Fear. Abraham is a man of biblical proportion, but also a man that experienced real faith and real fear. So this is a message that is so relevant for us today. Pastor Spencer is going to lead us as we dive into the scripture together. Today, as we worship together, I invite you to engage. There's a chat feature on your screen. I invite you to go ahead and talk to your friends that are with us in worship today. Also, if you have a prayer request, we would love to receive that request. And we have people ready to pray with you. Today is also the beginning of Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, the Sunday where Jesus was faithful to his calling as savior of the world. Today, let's celebrate Jesus's entry into Jerusalem together. I'll start and then join me with the words on your screen. On this day, Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed King of Kings by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let these branches be a sign of victory for those who follow in his name and hail him as King leading in the way of eternal life. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Let's worship. Your love is strong. Your love. 
strong Your love is Your love is Your love is strong As we come to this time of prayer together what a gift from God that, it, that we can have this conversation with God as well as each other. And today as we begin in our time together, I invite us to, to step out of ourselves and to pray for others. In the midst of this virus, there are so many people that need our prayer. And so we'll begin there. I'll start, I'll lead us off, and then follow along on the words on the screen. Gracious God, Give skill, sympathy, and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Lord, strengthen them with your spirit that through their work, many will be restored to health. God of compassion, be close to those who are in isolation. Lord, be their consolation and their anxiety be their hope and their darkness be their light. Holy Spirit, Give strength and courage to those who are fearful at this time. Lord, help them to put away all thoughts and actions that separate them from you and others. Gracious God, give us all the grace to live our lives confident in your promise that you are always with us. And now as we continue our time of praying together, let's become more specific. Let's pray about the people in our lives and the circumstances that we find ourselves in right now. God wants to hear what's on our hearts and minds. God is with us. And so as we pray together today, let's, uh, let's just be real specific with God. In our last portion of prayer together, last but not least, let's give thanks to God. In these times, it's so important that we be thankful for God for the little things and for the big things in our life. God is still showing up. And so I invite us as we, as we give thanks, whether it's the, uh, the smile of a child or a flower in the garden, a phone call from a friend, whatever it is, let's give thanks to God. Holy God and kind Father, we thank you for the gift of this day and this time of worship together. Lord, we confess that we find ourselves today and in recent weeks uh, disoriented and we are humbled. God, we thank you for the, the many people that are serving us selflessly in our nation and world and specifically amidst this, uh, this virus, we pray specifically for the protection of healthcare workers, uh, for people who work in grocery stores, uh, for truck drivers. God be with them and help them. We, so, uh, we are so, so grateful for their service in ways that before seemed uh, important, but not so essential. But God, we have found how important all work is and how all work has dignity. So God, again, bless those people. And most of all, God, we need you. Come Holy Spirit, come and be with us. Again, help us to step outside of ourselves and to care for others. Help us to find your, your leading in our lives. And God, most of all, we praise you and we love you. And now we have a new component of worship today as we invite the Freemans 
to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of offering together today, we give back to God out of all that God has given to us. God is so generous. God gives and gives and gives. We thank you so much for your tithes and your offerings, your gifts that make the ministries of Schweitzer uh, really happen here. Uh, lives are changed, lives are transformed, and we are grateful. You can give by going to sumc.co slash give or to our new church center app. Let's continue to worship. Again, thanks so much for your generosity. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my Lord Thou hast taught.
Good morning, Schweitzer. Uh, Pastor Jason here, and I'm with the Lazaro family, uh, Christopher and Courtney and Atticus and Tolkien, and they are getting ready to come into membership. It's the first time we've ever done membership this way. And we ask everyone who comes into membership a couple of questions. The first question is, uh, Christopher and Courtney, or Chris and Courtney, do you guys love Jesus? And do you want to be his disciples? Yes. Yes. And do you want to follow after Jesus at Schweitzer and with the people of Schweitzer with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Yes. And what makes you want to live out your discipleship at Schweitzer? What, what brought you to this place? We're looking to join a church that really has a heart for Springfield. We've decided that's a place where we want to invest um, our, our energy and our, our talent and our resources. And uh, as part of that, that search and that journey, um, Schweitzer just stood out to us as having a number of ministries that were already mature and um, really showed a, a love for the community and the people of Springfield um, and uh, opportunities to plug in and, and be part of that. So that was, I know that was one part that was really interesting to us. Yeah, I think at the membership class, um, when you guys talked about uh, the concept of provenient grace, that really resonated with me, um, just leading to a generous orthodoxy. And I see that as a really great way to um, reflect God's love to all people. Well, we are so glad that you guys are coming into membership and that Schweitzer is a place where you're able to connect and, and follow Christ and join with the community. Uh, a question that we like to ask, and, and we do ask everybody who's in the congregation when people join, is will you support Chris and Courtney and their family as they follow after Christ? Will you support them with your prayers, your encouragement? If so, we normally say to respond, we will. So you can respond, we will today, but you can also hit the heart button. Just let everybody know that you are accepting Chris and Courtney, welcoming them with love, with the encouragement, and with your prayers. Chris and Courtney, thanks for joining us this way today. And thank you for being a part of Schweitzer and doing what God has placed upon your heart, entering into what God has placed upon your heart in this place, in this city, in this community, in the name of Christ. Amen. We believe in the power of stories. Each week this year, we're telling a new story of how God is working and transforming in lives of people connected to Schweitzer. God is so good, and these stories are, are really reflecting the nature of God, how God joins us in our lives and changes things in the way that God would have them. Let's watch this week Keeley's story. The beginning of my mentor and I's relationship was pretty rocky. She called me out and that definitely put me in my place. I wasn't used to that. And from there we grew and she taught me a lot about myself. She taught me a lot about boundaries, um, a lot about relationships. I got to come through to Schweitzer through a sober living home. And I just came here because it was required, but then there was the life change plan. And you weren't required to go to the life change plan, but I wanted to do it on my own because that was one thing that I decided to do. Through all of the ups and downs. Um, I had to go, you, you try, you're always trying to find yourself, right, through your addiction. You're trying to find what works and trying to find out who you are and who you're going to become and what, even what you want to become. And I, my main thing was just, I want to know me and I want to be myself. I want to know who I am. And it took me a lot of um, sober living homes <laughs> to run through. And then Coach House was my, la was my final my final place where I learned who I was and I learned um, what morals I wanted to have. I used to argue with everyone about every single thing that had to do with the church or just because it wasn't because I thought I was going to be right. I just didn't want them to be right. <laughs> and my mentor sat me down and told me that I was already 
more like him and that I was already doing things like him and I didn't know it. Like it wasn't always as easy for me to share that I'm coming, like that I'm becoming softer. Like, you know, you get sober and you're not as rough around the edges anymore. You have to get used to that. You have to get used to that, that you're gonna care about people. And it's weird to say like, it's not easy to care about people, but it is now. It's easy to care about people now. And I love it. it. Helps me get up in the morning to know that I have a relationship with myself now. I have a partner. I have a family. And I have a family here. My outlet to growing through it was helping other people. And the church has the best opportunities for that. And I think with the church having that it's not just for addicts, it's for people that are broken. I really like that. My name is Keely Shrum, and this is just the beginning of my story. Well, friends, welcome today. My name is Spencer, and I'm the pastor. Uh, this is part three of a series called Faith and Fear. We're spending uh, several weeks looking at Abraham. Abraham is a hero of faith, and yet at the very same time, Abraham is somebody who struggles deeply with fear. And so we're looking at, at his life, but this isn't a, a biography of Abraham. Really, we're trying to understand the dynamic between faith and fear, and how is it that we can be people who live by faith and not by uh, fear. Today is also Palm Sunday, so happy Palm Sunday. I'm not really sure how you do that greeting, so happy Palm Sunday. Um, next Sunday, of course, that means it's Easter, and uh, we will be here um, online for Easter. I know that's, that's a disappointing thing, but, but even though we're, we're online for Easter, you know, we still celebrate that the grave is empty that Jesus is still alive, that uh, we still have hope. And this is what we're going to celebrate next week on Easter. And I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll invite people, not to be with you, but you'll invite people to come and participate in our Easter services. This will certainly be one that you'll remember because it's one that we aren't gathering together physically, but we will still celebrate um, all the hope that Easter gives us. And so join us next Sunday for Easter. We've got Good Friday this week as well. We're going to celebrate uh, who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing and how he's alive today. Um, Today, though, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 16. Uh, this is, uh, uh, just kind of full disclosure, this is a difficult chapter. We're going to be reading about Abraham's life here. It's a difficult chapter because this is one of those stories we're about to read where you are going to be very disappointed in Abraham. This is, this is not a highlight for his life at all. So sometimes Abraham is the kind of person that you want to be like. He's, he's an inspiring person. And then sometimes Abraham has this deep struggle with fear and, and is just crushing in his disappointment. And so that's what we're gonna to read today. It's this, it's this struggle between faith and fear that we see in Abraham's life that I think makes him so compelling. Uh, before we get there, I do wanna just kind of retrace some of our steps for anyone who hasn't been with us the last few weeks because where we've come from is really important for, for this week in particular. Uh, we met Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, two weeks ago. And at this point, his name is not Abraham, it's Abram. And, and as we met Abraham, there was a promise that God gave to him. Genesis chapter 12, here's the promise. God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And then verse three, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this promise that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you uh, is really the storyline of the rest of the Bible from Genesis 12 to Revelation 22. The rest of the story is about how God uses Abraham and his family to bless the world, ultimately, of course, uh, through Jesus. Now, now, with this promise, God also told Abraham, he's 75 years old at the time, he's told him to, to leave his home and to go to a land that God would show him. He didn't even tell him where it was going to be, he just like, go that way. And Abraham was 75 years old, he's married, he's wealthy, he's settled in life, and yet he does this incredibly inspiring thing that, that he goes. And so we see Abraham right off the bat living this inspiring um, faith that, uh, that just trusts and obeys what God has for him. And then the very next story, the very next story, uh, Abraham is in the land of, of promise, the land of Canaan that God has given him. A famine hit, life's get, life gets hard, and he hightails it to Egypt. God tells him to go to the promised land. He goes to Egypt, and when he's in Egypt, he, he makes these fearful choices where he treats his wife in a really disgusting way, and, and uh, it's just a really disappointing story. It's, it's the struggle here between faith 
and fear. This is what we, we saw on, on week one. Week two, last week, Genesis 15, God restores Abraham and, and uh, begins to speak into him and re- renews this, this promise that he made to him. And so in Genesis 15, God makes this promise. It gets more specific about this great nation. And he says this to him in verse four. He says, a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then it says in verse five that he, that is God, took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And so elderly, childless Abraham uh, hears this promise and he hears what God is speaking to him and his response is so inspiring because Genesis 15 verse six, it just says this, that Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham is, is living um, this, this life of faith, he takes God at his word. This is, this is faith. And so you can see the pattern here. There's, there's moments of faith, there's a struggle with fear, there's faith, and here we go, Genesis 16, here comes a struggle with fear. So here's how this goes. Genesis 16, verse one, here's what we read. It says, now Sarai, later her name will become Sarah. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. So God's promised them children twice now. God's promised them children and Genesis 15, it was very specific. It was a son. God's promised them children, promised them a son, and, and they're, still, they're still waiting in this next chapter. They're still waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And you gotta think about how difficult this must be for them. They're, they're 75 years old when God calls them. They're elderly. They're, they're past this time. Um, God calls them to come and do this and to, to move and gives them this promise of the son, this child, and how difficult must it must be. Their whole life, they've had this struggle with infertility. And uh, this is a struggle. Some of you know firsthand how difficult that struggle is. And, and then God also speaks this promise to them. And so you have this, this dynamic in their life where on one hand, God has made this promise to them, this, this child, this son. And then on, on the other hand, it's just like, it's just not happening. There's this, this gap that they have, the promise of God on one hand and then, and then reality on the other. There's this gap in their life between these two, the promise of God and and the, the reality of their circumstances. And, and this is a gap that any person who's going to live by faith is going to experience. This gap between God's promises, God's will, what we know God can do, and just sometimes the reality of what our lives actually look like. We find any person who wants to live by faith is going to experience this gap, and it shows up in all kinds of ways. This is the gap that we feel when we know someone we love is sick and we pray and pray and pray for them and we know that God can heal them and yet we just have to keep praying. There's what we know God can do that he's a healing God and yet at the exact same time there is the reality of the sickness and there is just this gap that we have to deal with or, or this is the gap of the marriage where, where he's sleeping in the basement and they're not talking anymore and yet you know that God is a God who can restore relationships and so there's this gap between, between uh, the promise of God, what he can do and, and the reality of, of what our life looks like or, or this is the gap when you know someone you love is, is making destructive choices, maybe addictions, and you know that God is one who can deliver, and yet you keep praying and praying and praying, and this person keeps struggling with their addictions. It is this gap that all of us have to deal with. This is the gap that Abraham and Sarah are facing, the gap between, I know God has promised me this, and yet here is what life actually looks like. There is a gap. And all of us have experienced this in some ways. And, and what you do when you find yourself in one of these gaps makes all the difference to being a person who lives by faith or being a person who lives by fear. I'm gonna say it again. How you handle this gap, what you do when you find yourself in those gaps makes all the difference on whether you're gonna be a person who lives by faith or somebody who lives by fear. Abraham and Sarah, they do not handle this gap well. They do not handle it well because these gaps are uncomfortable. They they are scary when you find yourself in these gaps and they do not handle it well and they take an unfortunate shortcut to try to deal with it. And so let's keep reading here and see how they deal with this gap. So they've got no children. Uh, That's how it starts off uh, verse one and then keep reading verse one. It says this, but she, that is Sarai, had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, that is Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children, which is an interesting sentence because it's also the Lord who has promised the children. But anyways, so she says, here's the solution. 
Um, Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. And as strange as it sounds, um, this is the way that the ancient world sometimes worked, that um, a child born through a slave could be recognized as your own child. And so what Sarai is doing here is something that that would have been somewhat common in in her world, or at least allowed in her world. And so let's keep reading here. Um, See how this goes. So verse three says, so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Uh, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And I want you to catch that really important detail we just read in verse 3. Ten years. They've been living in Canaan, living with this promise of a great nation and children for ten years. Ten years. All right. Verse 4. So Abram, he slept with Hagar and she conceived. So 10 years of waiting, 10 years of wondering, 10 years of longing, 10 years of questioning, when is this child gonna come? And now all of a sudden she's pregnant. It's just, it's the wrong she. She's pregnant, it's a miracle. Turns out that God just needed a little help with this miracle to to make it happen. And, And so it's not hard to see as you start reading here through Genesis 16, it's not hard to see that this is a decision that Abram and Sarah are making through fear. This is a decision based in fear. It's fear that God's not gonna come through for us. It's fear that, that God's not going to fulfill his promise. It's fear that, that God is going to be unable to do what God has said. It's fear that there must be something wrong with them. It's, it's fear that maybe God doesn't care or fear that God's just going to let them just, just be out there by themselves. It's just fear. This is a, a decision that they're making based on fears. And, and one of the things I want us to see in this series is that the choice between faith and fear uh, is not just a choice of emotions, Right? Living in faith or fear is not just about how we feel, it's about the kinds of choices that we actually make. Because faith and fear are going to show up in practical ways in our lives. So it's not just that you feel faith or you feel confident or that you feel fear or you feel that you're afraid. It's more like, what do you do when that fear hits you? What, what kind of choices do you make? How, how are you going to treat people? How are you going to respond to this? What, what practical way is, is faith going to show up um, regardless of how you feel? It's a practical kind of thing. The, the choice between faith and fear is not really about what, is, what we feel. It's, it's about what we do and how we actually live. Um, the choices that we actually make, it's a, it's a very practical thing. And so I want you to see that. Um, as we keep reading here, I also want you to see that when we choose to live in fear, there are consequences to this. And so let's read some of the consequences, how the story keeps going. Here's what we read next. It says, when she, that is Hagar, knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abraham, Abram, <laughs> says, you are responsible. I think that's how it goes. You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that uh, she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between me and you. And I think Abram must have like, heard this and looked around and thinking to himself, what are you, what are you talking about? This, this was your idea. <laughs> Actually, what he says is this, verse six. He says, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. And he washed his hands of the situation and he walked away. And this is one of the pictures of some of the worst leadership that you ever see in the Bible. Terrible, terrible leadership. If you, if you want to be a bad leader, do exactly what Abram does right here. Avoid conflict. Don't handle your problems. Uh, don't handle the thing he- head on. Uh, pass the blame, pass the buck to somebody else. Say, ah, it's on you. You figure this out how to do this. Like, this is terrible, terrible, terrible leadership. And it just keeps getting worse. This, this fear that they're living into, it just keeps snowballing into worse and worse decisions. Here's what we read next. It says, then Sarai mistreated Hagar. And the word there in Hebrew uh, for mistreated should really be translated more like, like she abused her. It's, it's, it's a word about physical violence. Like she's physically abusing Hagar. And so Hagar, she said, fled from her. The problems, they just, they just keep growing. They're, they're snowballing here. They just keep growing. So verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord, which oftentimes when you read the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and you read the, Hebrew, the angel of the Lord, that's code for the Lord. So the Lord um, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the, the road to Shur, just in, in case you're wondering where that spring was. And, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And I just want you to notice something incredibly important that just happened. For the first time, 
Hagar is spoken to. Up until now, Hagar has been spoken for. She's not had any say in what's happening. Uh, decisions were made for her. She had no power. She had no choice. She had no um, sense of, of what she wanted to do. Everything was decided for her. When the Lord shows up, he speaks to her. This is the first time that we read that Hagar is being treated with dignity, with respect, that this is the first time that she's being treated as a person. And this is what happens when the Lord shows up. He finds the castaways and those who have been mistreated and he welcomes them and he invites them and he treats them well. This is what the Lord does. And so he speaks to Hagar a question both about her past and her future. And uh, Hagar replies back to the Lord and she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. So notice she speaks about her past, but not her future. And then it says, then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. And she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram gave him the name Ishmael to the son he had born. And then verse 16, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. There are times when Abram lives by faith and uh, it's incredibly inspiring and, and I want to be like him. And then there are times where Abraham makes these terrible choices of fear and I just don't want to be like him um, at all. And as I read through Genesis 16, this incredibly disappointing chapter, this incredibly disappointing story of Abraham's life that's just full of fear, I'm left wondering, why is it that Abram and Sarah, what, what is it that made them choose fear? Like, what, what is it that happened in the story? Like, what was the thing that took place? Because there's not like there's this thing that happened all of a sudden that should have made them afraid. It's not like a plague broke out, or it's not like there's a famine, or it's not like, like uh, there's a war that's happening that, that all of a sudden there, there's a new detail, a new circumstance, and now they're afraid. And so I can't figure out what is it that's making them make this, this fearful choice. And the only thing I can come up with is that in verse three, there's a little detail about their life, and it just simply says this that they had been living in Canaan for 10 years. So at some point, all that waiting and wondering and disappointment, it catches up to them. And you got to start to think that, that for them, maybe they're, they're thinking, man, it's been 10 years. Maybe it's not going to happen. I know the Lord said this, but, but maybe it's not going to happen. And, and this is the gap we were talking about earlier. Like, like there's this gap between God's promise. There's this gap between God's will for us and God's plan for us. And then there's this, there's, versus reality. This is what our life really looks like. And it turns out that how you handle this gap, it really matters. It really matters. And of course, Abraham and Sarah are not the only people in the Bible who live in this gap. Um, for instance, in the Psalms, there's this prayer that's prayed over and over and over again. I think it's something like 25 times in the Psalms. We read a prayer that goes like this. Here's an example of this prayer. It's Psalm 6 verse 3. Uh, my soul is in deep anguish. That's what you feel like a lot of times when you have the gap. My soul is in deep anguish. And then it says, how long, Lord, how long? And so 25, about 25 times in the Psalms, you read some sort of prayer that goes like that. How, how long, Lord? How long do I have to wait? How long is it going to be like this? How long will there be this gap between what I know is your will and what my life really looks like. How long is it going to be like this? How long is it going to feel like this? How long until you heal me? How long until you answer that prayer? How long till you give me direction? How long am I going to be in this place? How long, Lord? How long? Because I see your promise over there. I see your promise over there, but this is what my life really looks like. How long? How long? How you handle that gap, it, it matters. It matters. Because when you're in that gap, it is so incredibly easy to give in to fear. There's a word in the Bible that, that um, I've gone to that helps me think through this gap. It's a, it's a word that's used throughout the Old Testament and I think is really helpful for navigating these gaps. It's a Hebrew word. Remember the Old Testament was written not in English, but in Hebrew. And uh, there's, so there's this Hebrew word that's used throughout the Old Testament. I think it's fascinating and I think it's incredibly helpful for navigating this gap and how you think about this gap in your life. And the Hebrew word is this, kava. Kava. You can go ahead and say it. So you're at home. No one's listening. Kava. That's how it is. Kava. Let me give you some examples of this word, kava. Here's um, Psalm 27, verse 13. Uh, it goes like this. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then it says, wait, that's the word, kava in Hebrew. 
wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart. And again, wait or kava for the Lord. There's that, there's that word. Here's another example of this word. Um, this is Psalm 37. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait, there's the word kava, patiently for him. So oftentimes in the Old Testament, uh, kavah is translated as this word wait, and you see this throughout the Bible. We are told many, many times, especially in the Psalms and the prophets, that, that we need to wait on God, that we need to be still, that we need to be patient before the Lord. And, and so, of course, waiting is one of the things that you do when you find yourself in one of these gaps. You, you got to wait. But, but what's so fascinating about this word kavah is that it's not always translated as wait. Here's another example of this word. This is Isaiah 40, verse 31, a very famous verse goes like this. Uh, Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So again, in the original Hebrew, this word kavah is in this this verse. And and I I just wonder, can you guess where it is? It's the word hope. Hope. I I read usually from the NIV, New International Version. And if you were to read this verse in, in many other verses, Uh, translations that is, um, it is likely that Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 is translated in your version as as wait. It's a a word that is used interchangeably. Kava in in biblical Hebrew um, can mean wait or it can mean hope. It's the exact same word because you see in a biblical framework to, to have hope in God is to wait on God. And to wait on his timing, it's to wait on what is unseen, it's to wait on on his promise, it's to wait in faith that God is going to do what God is able to do. To, To have hope in God is to wait on him. Now stay with me because this word kava gets even more interesting. Um, it, it's, it's built off of a, a root word. And in Hebrew, root words are very, very important in how you understand the language. And so it's built off a root word that on the surface, this root word looks like it has nothing to do with uh, hoping or waiting because the root word for, for kava, where this word comes from, is the word that we have for rope. It's, it's, it's rope. The Hebrew word that's been translated as rope. The root word for kava is the Hebrew word that's, that's translated as rope. And so people who study this kind of thing, scholars who spend their lives looking at root words and where these things come from have noticed that this is a very strange word that would have originated as the word rope and then come to, to mean um, hope or wait. And, the, and people who study this kind of thing like scratch their heads wondering how in the world did this word that means rope come to mean hope and wait? Like how did this take place? And so some people who study this kind of thing have noticed that maybe the reason why this word that means rope came to mean hope or wait is because ropes um, are made to hold tension. And if you ever find yourself in the gap between God's promise and God's will and God's hope for you, God's, God's ability to move in your life, and then on the other hand, the reality of what your life looks like, you'll find that there's a certain tension in that. It's not something that you hold easily. It's something that's difficult. Because if you, if you ever have had to wait on God in your life and you've had to live within this tension, you will know that this tension is difficult. It is not easy to have faith when you find yourself living in one of these gaps between what my life looks like now and what God can do. To Abraham, this is the tension of a childless elderly couple and the promise of a son. This is tension. So the question is, what do you do with this tension? Because how you handle that tension, it makes all the difference. And this is the difference between faith and fear. What this word kava really teaches us is that we should not expect the choice of faith to be easy. It's full of tension. To live by faith is to live with intention. It it is far easier to live by fear than it is to live by faith. It's far easier to, to become consumed by our circumstances, to become so focused on all the things that are wrong or what our lives really look like that we lose sight of what the promise of God is that he can do in our life. It's so much easier to become focused on on all that's wrong and to begin to live by fear. And that's, by the way, how you know you're living in fear. You know you're living in fear when what has your attention is not the promise of God. When you are consumed with with all the things that are wrong, it's it's the sign. That's one of the signs that you're living in fear because that's what has your attention, all the circumstances of your life. 
And so what we're talking about today, and in, in, in this series, you know, it's, it's so much bigger than the coronavirus, which is really what motivated this series. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've gotten several emails and messages from people in the church, and, and people are telling me about what's going on in their life. And I realized that this series on faith and fear, it's, it's, um, it's stirred some, some conversations up for some people. And, and so I've gotten messages from people about, about health problems. I've gotten messages about people with marriage problems. I've gotten messages from people with, with uh, job questions and kids and all kinds of things. Because there's, there's all kinds of ways that fear uh, can grab your attention. And the choice of faith then is that in the midst of all of those circumstances, in all of the ways that you might find yourself living in a gap, the choice of faith is that we're gonna to choose to live with that tension because we're gonna wait on the Lord. We're gonna have hope that he is still able to do what he can do, that his word is still true, that though my life looks like this, I, I can still have on, hold on to hope. I can still um, trust in him. I can still wait. I, I can, I, I'm not gonna to have to give in or give up to these circumstances, even though it would be easier to do this. This is what it looks like to live in this tension is, is, to, is to live with this grit that I'm gonna hold on to what I know is God's will for my life. I'm gonna hold on to that. In the New Testament, Paul talks about this tension really well. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter four, this is one of my favorite verses. And if you find yourself right now in this gap, whether it's your health or a relationship, it's your marriage, it's your job, maybe it's just COVID-19. If you find yourself being consumed by, by thoughts of the circumstances and the fear and what's not going well in your life, I encourage you to look to 2 Corinthians four. Maybe this is a verse that you need to write out. You need to put it somewhere in your house or in your refrigerator, somewhere you're gonna see it a lot. But I just want you to hear how Paul uh, gives us some instruction about how to deal with the tension, the gap that we fill in our life. Here's what he writes. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Because that's one of the things that can happen in the midst of tension. When you, when you find yourself in this gap between what life looks like, the reality and what God's promises, it's easy to become discouraged. It's easy to become, uh, to lose heart. So he starts off, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, right? Though my circumstances aren't, aren't positive and they don't, they don't bode well for me. Though, though outwardly we're wasting away. He says, yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not just on our circumstances. We're not gonna become consumed by all the things that are wrong, but rather, he says, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, friends, the choice to live by faith is never gonna be easy. And so don't kid yourself in thinking that it will be. Whenever you find yourself living uh, between uh, a gap between your circumstances and what you know is God's will, it is going to be difficult. It, it, it's going to be something that takes um, patience and perseverance and grit. It's gonna be something where you're gonna have to hold on to tension. But this morning, I just want you to be encouraged to fix your eyes, not on what is seen, on all the problems and the things that are going wrong, but rather on what is unseen, on the glory that awaits us on the promises of God and what he can do for us, on the word of God and his hope for us. Fix your eyes on this hope. And even in that tension, then you can hang on to what God has for you. Let's pray together. And so Lord, this morning, uh, as we gather online worship, circumstances are certainly not what we want them to be. Uh, we wanna hold on to hope to hold on to this. We know that it takes waiting. We know that there's tension in this. For some of us watching this morning, participating this morning, we know that uh, there are real questions and, and struggles that people are facing, that there's a real gap in their life, things that they've been praying for, some of them for many, many years. May we be encouraged to hold on during this time, to continue to choose faith and not fear, to not give in to the circumstances, but rather to continue to look to you because we know that you are faithful. We know your promises are true. And even though they may not be coming in our timing and our preference, we know that we can hang on and hold on to you, that we can wait in hope for you because you are true. Your promises are true. You are not slow in fulfilling them, but rather you work in your own timing and help us, help us, help us to hold on to that tension, to make that hard choice of faith instead of fear. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray.
Friends, it's been so good to join together in worship this morning. Um, I hope as you leave from here that you have been encouraged, that you've met with the Lord, that you've heard a word that's helpful for you. If this has been helpful for you, I encourage you to share this with others. You can do this on Facebook or send them an email or a text with a link from our website so that they can participate in this as well. There's a word of God for people here and I hope that you will share this with others. Join us next Sunday for Easter and invite someone along kind of with you, but to watch online. Have a great week. God bless you. Amen.